I was a kid trying to sell like jawbreakers and sweets. <laughs> uh, I was that kid. I went out of business pretty quickly. Ice because pops for me. <laughs> I, I ate my stock. So uh, it's not exactly good business practice. But yeah, really and truly, one of the biggest values of a co-founder is to tackle loneliness. Every single journey is so different that you can't just take a model elsewhere and then replicate it for yourself. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Founder of LiveLink, formerly Scoodle, which you're going to tell us all about later <laughs> today. But how, how was the commute here? It was hot. Uh, one train had no AC, the other train had an AC, so it's, yeah, first, first of all problems, to be honest. <laughs> London Live, right? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know that you are a busy man. Um, but Ismail, I'm just going to jump straight in, if that's okay with you. Go for it. Cool. So, obviously, you've just launched a new product. I just mentioned it previously. It was launched at Google HQ at the Somalis in Tech event last week, I think it was. An incredible buzz, an incredible vibe. Everybody there was amazing. Tell us more about it. What is LiveLink? Who's it for? At the very, very bare bones, LiveLink is a platform for creators to teach anything. Um, it's really simple in how it works. They choose a topic, date, time, and how much they'd like to charge. And ultimately, it allows creators to build a stronger relationship with their audience. So they might have tens, hundreds of thousands, millions of views coming from TikTok or YouTube or Instagram. And it's about channeling that into something that is more close-knit and is based on this ethos that we have, which is everybody has something that they want to learn and something that they can teach. And that's exactly what's happening, be it finance or photography or knitting, whatever the topic's going to be, LiveLink is a platform that can allow for that. Amazing. So are you finding that there's been this real shift at the moment from the traditional style of learning to what we see today? Oh, 100%. I think every single person that I've spoken to has always said that they wished they'd learned something whilst at school that they didn't get the chance to, and they're trying to learn that now. Different skill sets that are coming up and things that are proving to be pretty critical in their day-to-day -day life. I talk about things like you know, mortgages or learning to code, right? The number of software engineers now that are software engineers without having studied it in school or in university. So what we're seeing on the platform is exactly that. So different, different types of trading, for example, it's being taught on the platform, okay. learning how to take a high quality photo on amateur mode, uh, wrong word, learning how to take a photo on manual mode, it's called. I should attend <laughs> these classes myself, what am I doing? Um, but it's things like that that we're starting to see, which is really, really exciting. And on yeah. my side, most of what I do actually is speaking to these creators that have a massive set of skill sets and knowledge in so many different areas. All right, Ismail, you've got my brain wondering about what's going on here. So what, what even led to this idea? Where, when did it first happen? Officially, about a month ago. Um, unofficially, it's been, I think, years in the making, dating way back to when I was at university, for example, as a 19-year-old pretending that they could teach economics to 18-year-olds. Thankfully, those guys did okay. But the thesis back then wasn't that I was a qualified instructor or anything. It was a subject that I actually in, enjoyed and I found a group of people that could benefit from me teaching them that. And then you kind of fast forward that to our time at Scoodle, we expanded that into the academic space. So mm -hmm. all things academia, economics, <clears throat> maths, the sciences, foreign languages, mm -hmm. anything that you can get a qualification in, Scoodle is a platform that could cater towards that. But I think the evolution towards LiveLink is, again, I'm probably going to say this time and time again in this, uh, in this conversation, this idea that everybody has something that they want to learn and something that they can teach is not an academic sentence. And so the natural evolution is that as we start to see more and more people wanting to learn more and more things, it only makes sense to establish a platform that can cater for that, which has led to where we are now, and that's building LiveLink. Wow, and are people already doing this online? Oh yeah, uh, there are people that are earning, I think pretty close to full-time salaries now, wow. teaching on the platform, which is amazing to see. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that a little bit later on and just learn a little bit about where you're at now. But sure. before we get there, I'm going to dig into you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay? Cool, so I want to know where this story for you began as a founder. <sighs> when did you become a founder and how did you get there? When did I become a founder? It's the typical official, unofficial dates. Yeah. I'd like to think I was always kind of entrepreneurial, but without using that word. Um, 
probably the first time, I don't know if you had one of these in, in your school growing up, but I was a kid trying to sell like jawbreakers and sweets. Uh, I was that kid. I went out of business pretty quickly. Because Ice pops for me. I, I ate my stock. So uh, it's not exactly good business practice. But yeah. the idea was great. I think my, my best transaction was I sold back then like four jawbreakers in a pack. I think it was like 20 pence or something like that. Yeah, okay. I remember and, uh, I sold one for a pound. Yeah. One of the four. So it's pretty good margins. Yeah, amazing. Uh, and then the next version of, I guess, if you can call it entrepreneurship was graphics when I was I think 15 or 16 years old as a subject there was kind of what was required which is you kind of make some concept of a game or whatever you wanted to make I chose to make a board game and I was super super you know we should play it sometime I've still got it at home it was like football manager combined with top trumps put together and monopoly so one of the sections of the monopoly board was like a transfer window so whenever you land there you can buy and sell players and then on the other side you can play games against each other and I made like the entire game, wrote like a 10 page rule book and everything. It was really fun. And did you monetize from that? I called Hasbro and they didn't pick up and then <laughs> gave up. I tried, I tried. I didn't know how to go about doing it, but I think it's, it's a worthwhile investment, I'll be honest with you. So it sounds like you've always had these sort of like inventive ideas and you've always had that drive to make things happen. Is that fair to say? I, th I think so. I think it's always been fun. Like it, it's never been this idea of. <sighs> this is a way to get rich therefore let me do this thing conclusion I am now rich mm. it's always been these are quite interesting problems to solve or this is something that I can personally relate to quite a lot and you're going back to the board game thing I went way beyond what was required from the course not because I needed to but because I, I like Monopoly I like Form Manager and Graphics was pretty fun, and yeah. so that was that was the justification for putting in the effort that I did back then, and that worked out pretty well. That's interesting. So I'm going to fast forward. I'm going to skip a few <laughs> questions actually and go straight into it. <clears throat> so you obviously invested quite a bit of time into this board game, and at what why why did you put that investment in? You've mentioned that it's fun, but at what point when you're doing this in business do you say this is fun and this is worth doing i think i think people often over dramatize it what it takes to to build a business at the beginning it, and this is not to say that it's all roses and it's super easy all the time it's definitely challenging mm -hmm. but i think that the barriers to getting yourself up and running can sometimes be seen as higher than they actually are you know, what i mean by that is you don't have to go from working a job with a mortgage to quitting everything that you have because you've got something that you enjoy and it needs to become a business. Like that's, it's not either or. There is a transitionary period, which is working in the evenings and mm -hmm. working on the weekends. Um, solve, solve some personal problems for yourself. And then once you've solved your problem, mm -hmm. see if others find it interesting. You know, the board game didn't actually evolve into this super enterprise or anything, but I made it for myself because I enjoyed the game. The very next thing that I did was played it with family. Mm. Okay, let's play this game. Um, I always won, which I guess made the game, so it <laughs> should be like that. But That's important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, the, the process wasn't, oh my God, I've got this game now, so let me drop out of school and make it happen. It was, let me just make it because it's enjoyable. I spent probably 30, 40% of my GCSD times <laughs> making this one game and it evolves naturally. And then similarly, you know, with Scoodle, the very, very first parts of our journey wasn't actually okay we've got this idea now let's all quit our jobs right now and start and you know some people can be in the position to do that this is more of a you don't have to do that for it to necessarily work you can take smaller steps to try things out if you feel like your you know risk tolerance either isn't that high yet or cannot be that high right now it's, it's fine to just take small steps and go yeah. from there we have to play this board game by the way <laughs> it sounds absolutely amazing um, and I'm really intrigued to sort of piece all this sort of journey together. So to get straight to the point, there's probably quite a few people watching uh, this film podcast or maybe listening to the version um, online. What advice would you give to those people out there that have got an amazing idea, they want to move forwards with it, but maybe they're a little bit nervous about that sort of transition. Maybe they're currently studying and they're looking to go straight into creating a business, or maybe they're working for somebody already at the moment and they want to um, go down this route of self-employed, entrepreneurial um, <clears throat> mindset that, that maybe you went through. What advice would you give to those? I think it, it depends 
a lot on what stage they're at in, in this kind of entrepreneurial business idea journey. If mm -hmm. it's the very, very first kind of seed of an idea, mm -hmm. I would suggest that, you know, what I mentioned earlier, it's not a zero sum game where you either work full time for an organization or you go full time on your company. There is a hybrid that you can kick off with okay. and which, you know, in doing that, you almost kind of lower the risk a little bit. You kind of get to double your, your feed into what you're working on a little bit more before having to make that leap. So I think as a very, very, very first step, evenings and weekends, uh, especially if you've got a friend that you can work on this together with, is where I can spend my time on uh, to work on these projects. And then there's a scenario of, <clears throat> suppose you've done that now and it's, it's actually becoming a bit of a thing, you know, people are using it or you've built the first version and it's getting some revenue, for example, and that's pretty exciting. And then what do you do at that point? My thing is that for most people, at whatever stage you are at in life, it's likely that this is one of the riskiest scenarios that you'll be in to make such a leap anyway. Life very rarely gets easier, even though it might seem like it does. So if you're in your 20s, you might think, hey, by the time I'm 30 something or 40 something, I'll have much more money and I can afford to do that. The golden handcuffs is a very real thing. And so by the time you get to that age, mortgage and kids and all of these other things, it's like, well, why risk all of that? Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's, I don't know what salary you're in your 20s, let's just say 30, 40,000 or something if you're in, in London. By the time you're in your 30s, you're giving up a much larger sum of money. You are. So if you think turning away from whatever sum it is now is difficult, it's not going to get any easier in 10 years. No. And that's going to generally, not always, but generally continue uh, to be true. So I think I'd keep that in mind. And I think in the grand scheme of things, getting... Getting a job is something that is usually possible. Different economic climates can make it you know, more challenging for different types of people, and it's understandable. Uh, you know, in the climate that we're in right now, it's probably quite risky because job security isn't maybe what it used to be. But I'd say that you're, for me at least, when it comes to looking back at my life, I want to look back and know that I've taken decisions to do certain things even if they didn't work out in the way that I would have wanted. I would much rather be in that position than to be in the position where I say, damn it, I wish I'd tried. Whether it worked or not, I wish I'd tried. That's for me much worse than I tried and it didn't work. Mm, it's true. It's true in anything that we do as well, <clears throat> not just business, whether it's sports or business yeah. or a hobby that you may have. Absolutely. I'm sure that everybody watching this can sort of resonate with that to a certain, certain extent where they've maybe not pursued something that they perhaps should yeah. have done or Oh, 100. it's funny because everybody has had, I think, a version of that experience. Like everybody, in, I say in this room, right? I'm sure you have as well. There are probably things that you hadn't done in your life and you think, you know, I wonder what things would have been like had I done that. Mm. And then equally, there are things that you had done in your life and the worst case scenario is like, oh, that was pretty crappy. <laughs> yeah, that's and that's right. it. And you move on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, mistakes are just as valuable as our successes, right? We learn so much. Yeah. So, um, and I guess that's the same at work as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm sure you've never made a single mistake at Google, at Google in Dublin. Zero mistakes. Yeah. Perfection over here. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't relate. <laughs> So Ismail, little did you know, but I actually went to the Live Links Instagram and LinkedIn social media pages. Give it a follow if you're not already. Uh, that's my little sales pitch there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we asked the audience and our followers what questions they have for you. Um, so I'm going to get those up and we're going to go go through them if that's okay. Sounds good. So um, <laughs> first question, it's a good one. What's the biggest lesson you've learned whilst at Live Link? The biggest lesson from LiveLink, I think it's it's really important to make sure that you stick really closely to your users because you can very easily build the wrong thing and feel like it's the right thing Yeah. because ideas <clears throat> come from everyone and everywhere and it's, it's sometimes quite challenging to figure out what's worth working on, what's worth building, what's worth prioritizing and I think ultimately it's aligning that with what is in the best interest of your uh, of your power users. So the people that are using you every day and contacting you constantly with issues and things like that, those are the ones that really understand the product and can really help shape, shape the direction. So that kind of links in with what you were saying before. And when I asked you the question, what advice would you give to somebody that's just starting out and has a great idea? 
the idea that you originally had is that the reality of what we see today or is it altered and evolved slightly oh it evolved 100 percent. it's evolved um, and it's evolved in the direction that ultimately i think the users have taken us towards and partially along the the vision of myself and my co-founders mm -hmm. basis everybody has something they want to learn and something that they want to teach mm -hmm. right so let's start off with academia that's what we did that makes sense we understood that space really well mm -hmm. then the realization that we well, hold on a minute it's not just academics that want to teach or learning isn't just academic and so the evolution was okay let's do the same thing mm. but for non-academic learning and you think okay that's a sufficient shift Huge. but even within that then then there's a question of you know how do people want to actually teach because there's one-to-one -one, there's one-to-many there's live there's pre-recorded there's so many different variations of delivering sessions which ones are worth building first and then what and then what those types of decisions we evolve along with the demand of our users so you know right now on LiveLink there is the live component but also every session that you run on the platform is automatically recorded edited and re-listed back onto your page for you mm. and we do that because well the creators that we're working with value that uh, the amount of time that they save dealing with all of that content but also some users are in a different time zone right well, this is what I was getting at next. So what I instantly loved about LiveLink was this authenticity. <clears throat> and it was how, excuse me, <clears throat> it was how accessible learning is becoming and teaching is becoming. So, you know, I think somebody said, what better way to learn Arabic than, it might have even been yourself that said this, <laughs> what better way to learn Arabic than from an Arabic speaking teacher or educator in Egypt and how, you know, how would we normally access them kind of opportunities and lively sort of makes that kind of thing happen. Yeah, it, exactly. It's building a connection that I think people wished existed, but just don't. I think the reason why we had this kind of focus on creators is because you really do build this relationship with people, yeah. you know, so there are certain creators or, you know, one I'm a big fan of Andre Jeek, who's a finance person doesn't know that I exist in the world, but he's great. I love his content delivery. And I weirdly feel like I know him, but I don't, and he doesn't know me either. And it's just taking that one step further and actually starting to foster that relationship and that community between creator and you know those that benefit from them. Sounds like good branding to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go to the next question. I know we're running out of time. So next question that we got uh, on the LiveLink LinkedIn page. Uh, which you should also follow, another sales pitch. Uh, three lessons that you've learned when it comes to going into business with co-founders and hiring. And I'm going to add to that, co-founders forward slash friends and hiring. Three lessons, not even one. Uh, okay. No pressure. Let me think. Lesson number one is I think it's important to be with somebody or a few people that have resilience as a trait because interesting i think uh conflicts naturally arise not from a bad place but that's just what what's involved in working with different people and it's important to know that you can you can go on a journey together that is not going to be done <coughs> overnight and it's a big thing mm. i think the second thing is what's the opposite of complementary is that the word i'm thinking of skill sets that uh, work well together but that aren't necessarily the same sets of skills complement one it is a complement yeah isn't it? Complement, yeah complement okay. one another yeah like the uh, the rosemary might complement the thyme with the potatoes fancy guy you yeah don't yeah. trust me on recipe <laughs> advice there, but anyway. yeah so you don't always do the same things as co-founders and that's okay each person can have a different skill set so you know my two co-founders initially Imzad and Mujavid they uh, they built the first versions of our product i i don't code mm. so pitch whatever you want and speak to whoever you want the company doesn't exist without them absolutely and that's very very critical mm. uh, at the same time i think you know it's it's been valuable that you know whilst they were able to do that it allowed me to do things like fundraising and all of that stuff which hopefully added a little value to uh, to the business as well so i think that's the second big thing having skill sets that can work um work very well together and then the third thing is having a channel to communicate with each other openly on a frequent and regular basis. And this was a lesson I think that we've learned during the process of building a company. 
because even if you've known each other forever and you know you're friends for a long time friends usually don't actually see each other every day no. right you catch up maybe <clears throat> weekly and that's quite frequent probably every couple of weeks or every month which is nice and so you have a concentrated few hours of fun no conflict really to deal with it's different when you see somebody every single day and so we initially treated those relationships the way we would with the monthly catch-ups yeah and it's not the same thing because when you see somebody every single day and you work with them every single day there are likely to be disagreements or differences that exist that, that may not be communicated because the friendship side of the relationship didn't foster that you know, need to communicate like that, if that makes any sense. It, it does, yeah. You're almost like a, you see your co-workers and your co-founders, which are the same, probably more than we see our families and, fr and closest friends sometimes. Yeah, so, exactly. So yeah. the way that we solved that, I say solved, we try to solve and we continue to try is we have very regular founders catch-ups. Um, mm -hmm. So every two weeks um, for about an hour, we would sit down and the, the idea there is that we can bring up anything business-wise, personal, ocean-wise. Exactly, because yeah. if, if it's got a concentrated space, at least we know we can attempt to address any issues that come up. That's great. I think that's so important that, to, that you have that opportunity as well. Um, it's great as well, because one thing that was brought up in the Somalis in Tech event at Google HQ last week, um, shout out to those guys, by the way, was that one of the audience asked, is it quite a lonely place as a founder in their early days? But for you, I guess you had your co-founders, so it wasn't yeah. quite as much of a struggle. Am I right to say that? I've heard that quite a few times around loneliness, and I think there is a recurring pattern with solo founders. I'm going to add almost to, to the other answer about what it's like to work with co-founders and stuff like that and friends and all of that kind of thing. One of the biggest reasons, you know, when I talk about complementary skill sets and all of that, really and truly, one of the biggest values of a co-founder is to tackle loneliness. Mm. And it, that's not a, a skill set per se. It's, you need to make sure that you're compatible as like human beings, but it can be extremely lonely. I've spoken to quite a few people beyond the kind of honeymoon period of the first month of the idea. The excitement. Yeah, like you're in your bedroom or in a cafe by yourself on a laptop, uh, doing stuff and you're accountable to yourself so you can walk away and not work and what's going to happen is it's just you still or you're going to work and then there's a period where maybe you don't get the users that you wanted or things aren't working the way that you wanted and it's still you alone mm -hmm. and that's a recurring theme and challenge that I've heard of solo founders in particular it's not to say that it's not possible I, I know a few that have done well as solo founders as well it's just kind of by and large it's beneficial to to have people to work with so I'm going to go down the well-being route here because I see it pop up on my LinkedIn all the time. Ex ex excuse what I'm about to say, but how do you give yourself, metaphorically speaking, a kick up the backside to keep going? Is it Did your co-founders help with that or did you have to tell mm -hmm. yourself sometimes, this is going to work, I am going to make this happen? How, what do you do? I don't think there's any one thing, but there's probably a list of things that help differently at different times. So. Mm -hmm co-founders is definitely one of those things for me i find opportunities to speak like this to actually be quite helpful mm. because often what i do is i, I pitch what i do <laughs> yeah, constantly and that kind of yeah. gets you into this excited state which is very valuable as a skill set to have and then sometimes weirdly enough it's doing something very 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 different mm. be it gym or traveling and taking a couple of days out for example just to rejuvenate can actually be more fruitful for you and your business mm. than adding those additional days of work. It's not again to say that any one of those things is the answer, mm. but you will find that there's a combination of things that can help okay. and different things are helpful at different times. Okay. Well, yeah, appreciate that. I'm going to go on to the next question because I could probably talk to you all day <laughs> about this and I know we've got a set time. Um, quick fire questions then. And if this is a quick fire answer, how do you find investors? Very, very quickly, I think the way to find investors is to build relationships consistently with very smart people way before you need the money. Interesting approach. Tell me more. I know I said just one, one sentence. sentence he said. <laughs> but I want to spend so much time figuring out that one sentence. <laughs> yeah. I want more. Fundraising is a 
a process of relationships and people fearing that they're going to miss out on the next big thing. FOMO. Yeah. Uh, you solve the relationship side of things by building those relationships. There are different ways to do that. You can start off with your immediate network. You can you know, reach out to people on LinkedIn just for a coffee or whatever. Go to events that have interesting people, mm -hmm. have meetings with them. Once you've done that, you know, especially if you're working on something, update them with your work every month or two. Just, mm -hmm. you know, like, hey, this is where I'm at right now. Here are the updates. Could you help me out with this or with that? And you start to foster more than just a, oh, that was that person from that event to, I'm actually semi-mentoring this person almost. Nurturing them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to actually fundraising you, and this is the whole FOMO thing, you more seriously suggest the conversation, <clears throat> okay, we're fundraising now, we're going to be raising this amount or whatever. But those conversations, you want to cram them all into the same uh, space and time, in the same five-day period. Rather than you just coming to them out of the blue and saying, I want a load of money. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I, you see time sense. and time again where, and I've been in this position before, right? I see a TechCrunch article that says, so-and-so raised $20 million with nothing and like an idea. And like, wait, how did that happen? We have this and this and this and this, and we can't raise that much. What's going on? Mm -hmm. And you realize, and I've, I've been on the other side of the conversation here where, these were people that these investors had invested in like 10 years ago. They've Financially worked, or personally? Both. Yeah, They've okay. invested in their previous companies or they were early employees in a company that was backed by these investors before. There were like so many different connected pieces that lead up to the overnight $20 million raise. Yeah. It doesn't just happen and you need to kind of start planting your seeds now. You know, so in, in 10 years, a smaller version of me will come like, hey, how did this guy raise $20 million? <laughs> That's how it happens. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense when you, when you hear that out loud. I mean, it seems, seems just, <laughs> you know, the way to do it. I'm going to jump onto the next question because again, it's one of those that I can just keep going for. Um, so another question we got from a LinkedIn user on our page was, uh, what lessons are you taking to LiveLink after pivoting away from Scoodle? I think there are, okay. I've got the answer first. It's really valuable in terms of what we're taking. I think we are particularly critical in how we approach what we build before we build it, because you can spend a long time building in a direction that may not capture the type of market that you want. So for example, uh, we spend a lot, lot longer now thinking about, say, our, our business model or the core value proposition mm -hmm. for the users. Um, we would discuss it in quite a few meetings to make sure that it's particularly valuable before we, uh, we go about and build it. And so the way that that looks like in practice is that we're usually three or four sprints ahead in terms of design compared to work. So the design team and the product team go back and forth mm -hmm. uh, along with the engineering way before a line of code is written. Yeah, I think that, that planning phase Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Because uh, I, I'd say that, you know, and it's, it's a balance, right? Because existing quickly is really valuable mm. because you can learn very quickly what the right or wrong thing is to do. So this doesn't take away from that mindset, but it's just making sure that you put the right type of thought before you exist quickly. Makes sense. And I think that's an incredibly valuable thing to, to have. And then just on a tech level, a lot of the kind of <coughs> tech infrastructure can be kind of ported over to, to live links. So, we have live video, we had live video, we deal with payments now, we dealt with payments then. So that's made some of the transitions much easier. Sounds like you've been a little bit blessed with an amazing team along the way. Yeah, not so bad yourself. <laughs> um, yeah, no, the, the team is incredible. I think at the end of the day, the success of the company is 100% down to the quality of the team that we have. And I think that's going to be true moving forward. Design, engineering, marketing, product, everybody is, is incredible and I think especially you know as the company starts not even beyond that mm -hmm. you you can't underestimate the significance that the team makes not just in the quality of what you build but even in fundraising right a quality team raises more than one that isn't as good yeah and that's going to be a constant truth as we kind of continue on our journey mm -hmm. no really good good words um i'm going to jump through these last few questions from linkedin so um, this is a really current one. Will tech multiples correct if we have a recession? If I had the answer to that, I wouldn't be on camera right now. Who am I putting uh, my money into? Yeah. 
where to invest. This is the moment where all those creators are. This isn't financial advice. I know, None yeah. of that stuff, it's pretty serious. Yeah, we need to put like a disclaimer <laughs> on this video. What I can, I think, so, okay. My observation in, in the world of startups, uh, the extent to which this translates to tech multiples to be confirmed, but startup valuations seem to be going down, but the amount of capital that there is to be deployed is still constant from what I've seen. And what that means... Going up uh, or maintaining? Maintaining. And the reason why that is, is because VCs usually raise a sum of money to be deployed over a certain period of time. We've just hit the downturn now, but that money has already been raised. Mm. So it needs to be spent. Yeah. Like they, they need to make investments. They don't just kind of... Some of it might be held, you know, the whole you know, dry powder thing exists. But at the end of the day, that capital does need to be invested into other um, startups. And so that then becomes a story for their next raises. I think they've been holding off a little bit maybe now just to see where things are at. But again, the capital needs to be deployed. So what I think will happen is that deployment will kickstart again towards the end of the year, beginning of next year, because that's going to start adding to the story of their raises again. Now, the next question is, okay, well, what happens when these funds go out to raise more money? Mm. And I think that's the thing to think about a lot more. At that point, if the economic climate is similar to what it is right now, they would struggle to raise the way that they raised before. Got it. And that's probably, I think, where there's going to be the bigger hit. But who knows? Maybe <coughs> Ukraine and Russia will stop fighting by then and they can afford petrol again. Who knows? Yeah, it's going crazy. The cost of living, right? It's all over the news feeds. Uh, last question from social media. Um, well, there's actually two more, so we'll go really quickly through these. First one. How did you self learn the legalities of creating a startup? Yeah, and this you is a think quick I know one. the answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> did you he head to YouTube or how, how did that work? Most things are Googleable. Googleable, I like yes. that. Yes, most things in life, to be honest, not just the legalities of a company, but some of that you can fast track by speaking to other founders. So, our very first lawyer, we got recommendations from. Uh, from the founder that I knew uh, when it came to raising other bits of capital within the business, recommendations came from other people. So I think that can help fast track mm. some of the process, but I think, yeah, two parts. Very Googleable for the most part, but the amount of information that you need to know that early in your journey, you can cover 80% of it by a conversation with somebody like myself or any other founder that you know really well in about 15 to 20 minutes. So networking. Yeah. Last question on LinkedIn then. Hardest part of running a startup? The hardest part of running a startup? I'm gonna say one of two things. One is perseverance and grit is a great thing to talk about on camera and stuff, but it's much more difficult to live through that and to actually continue to persevere. And it's quite a challenging Thing emotionally I think as well mm. so I think that's a, a, a particularly large challenge and I think in line with that is and I think this is a product of obviously kind of hiring a quality team but balancing out the you know the direction of the company and then the demands of engineering and the demands of uh, of marketing the demands of product because one difference between a startup and say a 10,000 person company is that in a 10,000 person company somebody your senior has been there before. Yeah. Like, hey, do this, do that, and then sprinkle a bit of that, and you're good for a promotion in about 12 months. Perfect, you've got that pathway. As a founder, every single journey is so different that you can't just take a model elsewhere and then replicate it for yourself, and that gets you product market fit, and then you're good to go. And so you're constantly kind of trekking along this dark path without really knowing what, where the end is or where you know the beautiful view is going to be and things like that, yeah. which is one of the key differences. I think, yeah, a combination of those two things are probably where challenges lie. Do you know, we had a conversation, didn't we, on the way back from the Somalis in Tech uh, event at Google HQ uh, in London last week. And one of the things that you said to me, rightly so, and it sticks with me, is that whilst you worked at Google over in Dublin, the they had whole teams dedicated to very specific niches which is the complete opposite of a startup, don't we know? 
you know, everybody is, it's almost like everyone is all hands on deck. You, you tell me how many strands of marketing are you, uh, are you managing well, right I, yeah, now? No, I know, right? Every day is different. There's never a boring day, is there? You know, <laughs> you, you can't say that your job is repetitive in a startup because yeah. every single day you're doing, um, you're doing a new, you, you're trying to solve a new problem. You've got a new challenge. You've, you're discussing and brainstorming with the team. You know, you might be filming a podcast tomorrow. I could be doing budgets. Who knows? Yeah. I guess it's, is that from your experience, are you experiencing the same? Sort oh, of like 100%. I think whether you see that as a perk or not, it depends on who you are as a person. I think for me, the, there is an excitement in very big challenges that have unknown answers. And part of that is trying so many different things and working on so many different aspects of the business. But at the same time, I can also get why that just seems like a lot for <laughs> yeah. uh, different types of people. But yeah, that's part and parcel of being a, not even a founder, uh, that's part and parcel of being an early employee at a, at a company, probably like first 15, 20, 25 hires. Uh, beyond that, it starts to get a little bit more controlled. But, you know, with that comes all of the benefits that come with the stock options and being, you know, at the verge of a rocket ship and things like that. So you, the, the price of being on a rocket ship like that is having to get your hands stuck into so many different pies. Mm. So it's allowing yourself to be almost dynamic in your approach to work. Um, you know, every day you, you've got to have that flexibility and that drive. I know these are all big key words that, you know, we hear on posts on LinkedIn, <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? You know, every day you've got to be willing to adapt to whatever yeah. is thrown at you, thrown your way. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, exactly. Ismail, we've run out of time and I'm going to continue to talk to you off camera <laughs> because I've got so much to ask you. Um, just before we wrap up and before we go, one quick question. What message do you have for anybody watching this or listening to this on the podcast um, who has an idea and wants to move forwards with it? Just start. Yeah. Find the quickest way for you to get up and running. Uh, I think <clears throat> when we were testing out LiveLink, our first version of it was a Squarespace page at Google Forms. And I think payments that didn't quite work, but it functionally got things up and running. And uh, first few creators using that made up system made the kind of first few hundred dollars. So that was enough to act as a proof point. Yeah. And that's way simpler than hiring an engineering team and a marketing team and all these different things. I think the, the requirements for just starting are far lower than you think. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you so much again for joining us and I uh, can't wait to hear more. Thanks a lot. All right, take care.